Hello, everyone, and welcome to our podcast. Once again, we are very honored and excited to have special guest Gregory Manorino on our show for, for the second time and hopefully many, many more. And today we're going to be talking about all things financial, not just uh, the Federal Reserve uh, touch points, but also cryptos, currencies, and how all those things intertwine. Uh, and it's a perfect serendipitous time to have Greg on for this seminal moment in our history. Again, if you're new, please do like and subscribe to the channel as it helps us grow. Gregory, thank you for joining us on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's an honor. So I'm going to start right off with all the things that you typically talk about in your, your daily reports. I watch your reports every morning and enjoy them thoroughly. Um, you know, when our last show you were talking, we were sort of surmising about the time frame we thought the Fed might start to make their cuts. And now they started to sort of surreptitiously tell us under the cloak of night that uh, they're looking at May to July. And I think you had called it somewhere around the June time frame. So you were bang on the money. So now that they're starting to do that, what are your thoughts about when the rate cuts will actually start and the effects that will have on the old economy? Uh, it looks like June to me. Looks like it's a lock. Um, I expect the ECB to follow in lockstep as well. We just got this surprise cut from the Swiss National Bank. That really took me by surprise. And everyone I know, no one saw that coming. But the central banks are clearly setting the stage for this. I mean, it's their next phase. Uh, it's just so obvious. It's been so obvious to me what they want to do, how they were going to work this into uh, their, their their scheme here. Well, they, they already got the, the global economy by the throat. It's over. They got the, the consumer by the throat. The next thing they need to do is uh, find yet another avenue to inflate. And that's what they're going to do. Because see, most people have no idea that that's the only way a central bank can, what's the word here, uh, extort uh, more power out of, out, of, out of everything is by inflating and they're looking for yet another mechanism. It's, it's, it's kind of interesting. Let's look at the dynamics that are in play. We have the Federal Reserve that has been tapering dramatically down their repo program. All right. At the same time, they're tapering that down. We're seeing war expand. Trust me on this. And you know this for yourself. I'm sure there is no coincidence here. And now they're about to cut rates. And this gives them an excuse to, uh, again, issue all kinds of debt, and then buy it through uh, another mechanism here. That's all they're doing is, is 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 this revolving door, which is massively inflationary. In this case, they're going to have to create vast amounts of cash to get into the market and buy the debt. It's an incredible thing. But, you know, people don't raise their eyebrows about it because they have no idea of how the mechanism works. They think, oh, the Fed's magical. They can just say, hey, you know what? We're going to keep rates low. Can't just say it. They have to get into the market and... Uh, I think we're all in for a, a, a rude awakening here with regard to, I mean, who's making up the difference here with exploding debts and deficits here? Obviously, it's the central banks. We can't, you, you can't run a business like this. You can't run a household like this. But because we have central banks willing to lend all around the world, I mean, that's, of course, their goal here is to enslave us all in, in the literal sense. This is how it's working. And people are walking through time and space just, uh, you know, and with no idea idea of what is going on and it drives me oh, why are we having inflation why is this happening why is it because it's first of all it's all by design everything here there's no mistakes i was reading an article this morning i forgot who, who wrote it it was it was from either reuters or cnbc about uh federal reserve mistakes these are not mistakes this is deliberate what they're doing how do people not see that i have no idea Great point. I mean, you packed a lot in there as usual. And and like you said, you know, they keep trying to redirect people away from, you know, the elephant in the room about the dollar's decline, you know, and pushing it off on Russia and pushing it off on, you know, this invisible enemy, blah, blah, blah. But you can just, people can put the dots and see it's just continuing to hemorrhage. And all you have to do is look at your gas prices and your grocery bill. That tells you a lot of what you need to know on, on Main Street. Um, so again, thank you for that. Uh, Turning our focus a little bit in a parallel direction, Bitcoin is, um, we know about that. I think they're pushing 75 to 80 here in the next week or two, somewhere in that range. But I'm, it's really curious. I'm watching Greg in April because we have the Bitcoin happening. We have XRP's case that might possibly settle in April. We know it's coming. We just don't know the exact date. Um, you have money moving out of the stock market into the cryptos. So what is your outlook with all that being said on the crypto market for the remainder of this year? Well, look, I, I would ex expect it to be volatile no matter what happens here. People need to expect this. Uh, you know, people don't get it. 
it, it took me honestly a long time, many, many years ago to actually understand it myself. I'm an old school guy. So when this stuff came around, I didn't know what to make of it. And people are frightened of it because of, because of that. It's a new, it still remains a new asset class, honestly. But, um, you know, I think that it's this, this crypto space, first of all, I, I love it. You know that I'm in it pretty deep. I've been buying for a long time. Um, I own a bunch of different ones and I, I think, you know, look, it, it no, it's a no brainer in, in my view, how this is going to play out. All right. An eventual meltdown in the debt market. I mean, we just got a warning from BlackRock about this. Mm -hmm. We're going to get it. We're going to get a meltdown here. And cash is just going to move. It's going to move into other asset classes. And one of them, in my opinion, is, is going to be uh, cryptocurrencies. And uh, people will say, okay, Greg, well, which one? You know, look, with regard to, I always say to everyone, you know, default to Bitcoin. Why? Not because I think it's the best one out there, but, you know, but, but because it's the mommy and it's the one that everyone knows about. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's the one that, that people maybe, um, because they're more familiar with it, it, it's easier for them to own it if it's, uh, you know, saying it like that. But, uh, you know, look, my, my top on, on, there is no top in my opinion here. We're going to see, in my opinion, the crypto space explode higher explode higher again why debt market meltdown cash bleeding out of the debt market putting massive amounts of pressure on the stock market cash is going to move into commodities i've been telling people that for years other assets as well and into cryptos and i think it could be sh it will be people are going to be shocked they're already mm -hmm. shocked at where we are now i've been i've been hearing the nonsense from people oh it's going to zero greg it's going to zero greg oh, really no it's not going to zero. And the more I hear people tell me that, the higher I know it's going to go. I'm going to tell you the truth here. But th the fact is, uh, we, ha we haven't seen anything yet. Bitcoin, 70,000, 80,000, 100,000, nothing. Nothing, mm -hmm. in my opinion, as to where this is eventually going to go. Much, much higher. Okay. Yeah, I tend to agree with you. I think it's going to go up or six figures sometime this year, next, mostly next year, as things you know go uh, stratospheric. With that, as a segue, I know this morning you were talking about um, you didn't see a stock market crash till 2025 um, because of the election cycle. Uh, do you think there's a possibility that we will have some type of a flash crash this year? And if so, why? Well, look, uh, I don't, the movements of the stock market, okay, I do not really overly focus on them. I look at the drivers, the main drivers here. I want to see what's happening in the debt market. That's where I look first. If in fact, there is a flash crash or the market drops 20%, even 30%. If the debt market isn't sending me any strong signal that this is the big one, I'm buying. I'm buying more. People don't generally understand. Look, when people turn on CNBC and Bloomberg and Fox Business, all they talk about is the Dow 30, the Dow 30 or the Dow Jones Industrial Average. They don't want people focusing on anything else except those 30 companies. It's insane. Okay. But what's driving them, again, is this, this this environment we have is unlike anything we've ever seen. I think everyone that follows your work, and I'm certain the people who follow my work, would agree on that. The distortions that exist here are so unbelievably incredible. Um, and, and that's just setting the stage for what is eventually going to occur. Now, I don't believe, and I don't, I'm saying that in 2025, I think things are going to get kind of crazy, or we at least have the potential to get crazy here. And when people are talking about a market crash or whatever it might be, you know, you got to understand people have to realize that the real big one is not going to begin, nor will it end in the stock market. It's going to begin and end in the debt market. When we start to see an uncontrolled sell-off here in the debt market, we can watch this pretty clearly. We're just watching one metric here. I'm talking about the benchmark, the 10-year yield. If we watch that 10-year yield start to rise, bang, 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 that means there's a problem here. Um, and the market seems to be adjusting just as of late, but let's, let's hold that thought for a second. So if we start seeing a big meltdown in the debt market, we're going to see the stock market take a hit. That's the big one here. Uh, markets gyrating, that's what they do. All kinds of, you know, this market, people get all uppity uh, on, on all kinds of silly things, and the market just will do what it does. Yeah, We don't get pullbacks anymore. We don't get corrections anymore. It's an, it's an incredible thing. It just goes higher and higher and higher and higher. Uh, so far, what, this year alone, 20 record highs? You gotta be, it's, it's just crazy. You know, at the end of last year, I told people this is how it was going to play out. It was so obvious with the layoffs with the mass layoffs, which is the driver for the stock market right now, believe it or not. 
Uh, the mechanism behind that is pretty incredible. You got these companies here laying people off by the tens of thousands, and they're being rewarded by Wall Street. You got the promise of more easy money by the Federal Reserve, and it is coming as we started off with here. Um, you've got the prospect of war, which is bullish, and the, the currency devaluation. Um, so all of these things are playing in right now to push this market higher until the presidential selection period is over, and then we will see where this goes. We'll just reevaluate it at that time. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't be taking action now. It means that we should be thinking ahead uh, planning as to what actions that we might want to take. But again, you can't possibly go wrong, and no matter how this is going to go, because what do we know will continue to go on? Debts and deficits continue to balloon. Global debt out of control here. It's not going to stop. So you need to be taking the opposite side of that trade, betting against the debt, becoming your own central bank, holding hard assets, gold, gold and silver. Exposure to commodities, huge. Uh, moving forward and, and of course cryptocurrencies as well other things too artwork musical instruments you know i i think people i'm a very diversified guy i own a lot of things uh if you're only in one asset class it may be somewhat scary i mean but you know uh if you had to pick one i'm going to tell people what it is i always say all the time this is my favorite asset in the world silver so, and I, I love a lot of things but silver in my view just based on looking at the dow gold ratio and gold silver ratio and then kind of putting together, okay, where's the bottom for the Dow? Okay, I believe we're going to get a one-to-one -one Dow gold. I really, really, so, you know, 8,000, let's say Dow 8,000, gold 8,000. And then the, the ratio, gold, silver, 15, even 10 to 1. I mean, this is how I look at it. People are, you know, uh, uh, free to, to think about it in whatever terms they want to, but it just makes it simpler for me to understand if I can pick a bottom or at least try to say, where's the bottom in the Dow? No one knows where it is. What we do know is that the Fed jumped in here at Dow 6,000 with QE1. That pretty much set up a hard floor. Then we went up to QE2 and Operation Twist and everything else they're doing right now. But uh, but that's how I look at it. Fair enough. Thank you for that. Um you brought up earlier in our conversation a very interesting and underrated and important point in the aspect that uh, you've been in the industry for a while, and yet it took you a while to kind of realize the turning point. And for our viewers who don't know that background, can you talk about what what was that seminal moment that you realized the turning point, what was real and what was actually artificial in the market? With, with regard to cryptocurrency? Uh, just in general about... Uh, oh, well, you scheme. know, look, when, I, I, well, okay, I'll tell you, it, it, it's so obvious to me when I when when the market you know crash of 08 when the, when the meltdown happened over there and they jumped in with uh with QE1 I really felt at that time that it was the right thing to do why not because the market was crashing I what was really going on and very few people even the system was locking up it was a liquidity issue it was a liquidity crisis what was happening and we're going to face that again but with, there was no inter-business lending. Uh, everything was locking up. They had to free up the credit markets. It had to be done because people, there was, markets always react, overreact one way or the other, okay? So when QE1 was instituted just to free up the credit markets to get things flowing, in my opinion, that's where they should have stopped it. They should have stopped, but they didn't. That after the market started to recover and recover substantially, they went on to QE2, and then they went on to Operation Twist and whatever other freaking thing they did. But that was when they, the Fed said, okay, here's our opportunity to really take over the market, to, to reinflate a bubble here, a massive bubble in the stock market. Nothing makes sense anymore. A uh, real estate hyper bubble. And, and then subsequently off of that, you know, creating distortions across the entire spectrum of asset classes. But that's where... It should have stopped, in my opinion, when they went on and on. And I've, I've been on record saying this many times, haven't talked about it in, in probably years, but that's that was it right there. When they freed up the credit markets, they should have stopped. They should have allowed the market and economy to recover on its own, but they didn't. They just pumped easy money and epic sums into this. And now what they've created is a nightmare scenario on an unprecedented scale. We've never seen anything like this. We've never heard anything like this. But what they're doing, in my opinion here, is again, look, look at the, the global economy is coming apart. The consumer is destroyed. Now their next phase is to continue to inflate. This is how, since this is what central banks have wanted since their inception. 
uh, to one day become the lenders and buyers of last resort to become the government of the world. And that's exactly what they've done via the mechanism that 2008 event. In my opinion, look, looking back on it, this was obviously no accident either. It never is. And uh, a lot of people got insanely wealthy from that. You know, wealth always goes up, doesn't go down. No such thing as trickle down. Uh, I don't believe that. I've been telling people that for the longest time. And unfortunately, we're, we're being set up again on, on, on a much greater scale uh, because the system is being dismantled by central banks, in my opinion. So they can issue in a new system, one of maximum control, and they're going to make people beg for it. They're going to make people beg for it. Um, it's always the same thing, problem, reaction, solution. And that's what they're setting up right now. And it's going to be on an epic scale. Yeah, absolutely. It's always funny how the propagators of the problem all, all of a sudden have a magical solution that they don't want exactly. to create. <laughs> I mean, it's, oh, we're supposed to trust that the same entities that created all this are going to fix it too? Exactly. Really? Who who believes that? You got to be nuts. Yeah, totally with you right there. Um, understanding that you can't obviously make financial choices for people, but your word carries a lot of weight and credibility. For those who are in the market, let's say have oil stocks, what's the cryptos where we're going to see some of these, you know, mini bull cycles in, in like you said, in the volatility scales. Uh, do you recommend if they have debts, whether it's a car note or a credit card or even a mortgage, if they get a sizable return, do you recommend in most cases they cash out at certain points to take care of those debts or would you recommend they kind of hodl their position? No, no, I, 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 I mean, you know, look, people, everyone's situation is going to be different, but you know, I, I, I don't intend to sell anything if that gives anyone a clue. In fact, if, if anything, I'm looking. If let's 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 talk about cryptocurrency. We had a dip here recently. Um, it, in my opinion, it should have dropped more. It would have been nicer. I was looking to buy some more if it dropped a little bit, but now we're back up to like seventy with regard to Bitcoin. Bitcoin's my largest holding, of, and I own maybe six different ones, but Bitcoin's my largest of of the a bunch that I do hold. And I was looking for an opportunity to buy some more. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't present itself. It doesn't mean, I, I still think it's a buy now. I mean, there's no, in my opinion, I, absolutely. Um, people should be buying more and hold and holding on to all this stuff. Even the stock market, you know, everyone is so terrified about what's going to happen. And it is, you know, this whole thing, nothing makes sense, but we ride the wave for now. I've, I've been, you know, honestly, my track record is pretty astonishing when it's come to this. It's only because uh, I study it around the freaking clock. I don't stop except when I'm racing my car. <laughs> That's it. It's the only time I don't think about it. But um, so I think people need to be in this market. I think people need to be long pretty much everything right now while thinking ahead about how they're going to position themselves to capitalize on, on what's coming down the pike. It's it's not too hard. And, and like people worry about a stock market crash and a stock market crash. Yeah, it's going to come. Nothing makes sense. But until we see the signs from the debt market, and they, it's going to be a big one. And I tell everyone who follows, I will. I promise to keep everyone as far ahead of the curve as I possibly can. I feel like it's an obligation of mine. I have a lot of people that follow my work. So I, I have to be on top of it. Am I going to be wrong sometimes? Absolutely. freaking -lutely. But this is too easy to see. It's mm. just so glaring in our face. Everyone knows it. It's, this is no secret. Unless, of course, you know, maybe you're uh, watching one of the propaganda ministry channels and they're going to tell you this is all going to go on in perpetuity. They, they know it's not going to. Mm. Uh, I used to talk to a whole bunch of the guys on CNBC. Most of them aren't even there anymore. And they we would say one thing on the show. But behind the scenes, their perspective is totally different, totally yeah. different. But they, they can't do it. They can't, they can't. And, and I can't mention names, but these people, they know what's going on. Everyone knows what's happening, but the people are the last to know. And what's that saying? It goes, nobody knows until everybody knows. It's, it's, mm. it's, so, it's just so true. Yeah, no, absolutely right. Um, you were talking a minute ago about, uh, in parlance terms about, uh, you know, the devaluation market and a lot of the global economy kind of imploding and all the currencies attached to that. Uh, interestingly enough, as you know, uh, the BRICS nations is continuing to gain momentum. I think they're looking at another 40 countries getting ready to pile on and join to get into safe havens. Um, my question, Greg, is, you know, Russia is a big, uh, one of the big players, obviously, in the R of the BRICS. Do you see Russia playing an important role in the what's a good word, restructuring and saving of the global economy and the geopolitical landscape of things? 
it plays into what we were just talking about earlier. There's no, this is no surprise where we, why we're seeing war expand right now, where countries are being demonized. Um, they're already calling these the BRICS alliance the anti-American axis. It's an un- the, the wording here is incredible because it should bring people. If, if anyone has even the slightest clue about history, you know, look up the Allies versus the Axis. You know, it's, it's a, they're setting it up here, and this is a clear and present danger. There's no doubt about it. You can't blame nations for trying to sidestep the dollar because if it's, uh, I, I, I don't even want to say mismanagement. It's deliberate what they're doing. You know, look, I've been telling people for how long now? At least ten years. When I started this, that they're. These central banks are are working together to kill their currencies. Who can kill it faster here? And you know uh, what? I mean, I tell people this too. Maybe some it'll it'll wake up some people. I hope it does as they're listening to this. But the United States has today has basically two prime export products. Number one is inflation. We've been exporting ex- inf- our inflation to the rest of the world for, 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 for decades via the mechanism that's going on right now with the Federal Reserve and the World Reserve Currency. And number two, propaganda. Uh, so, it's, And the people here are, are, are the on the brunt the blunt end of, of the uh, propaganda. It's unbelievable. People buy it. I just, you know, it's amazing to me that despite what we're seeing and not not really i can't say it's amazing to me because people are distracted and being told to look here look here look here don't look over there they flash nonsensical things across um the 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 tv screens here and it's done deliberately they find a way to get people fired up look what's happening here oh no 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 don't forget about everything else this is where you need you know so people don't know what to do it's the it's a tactic that has been going on since forever here keep the people dumbed down keep them distracted keep them deceived and you you can do anything you want and that's exactly what we're seeing here but this is this is a big deal this this bricks thing and it it, it's uh it's getting bigger and it's becoming more of an look we're going to see I was telling people at the end of last year, war in 24, we're going to see a lot more. And I think it's going to get, get even a worse moving forward here as this, the quote unquote, and this is not me saying this, anti-American axis uh, gains more momentum here. Uh, and they're going to find reasons that we have to kill these people or we have to bomb these people. And they're going to make things up. They don't people don't. Don't think that they're any, I know you get it, are too far beyond them pulling off some kind of a false flag to make us, you know, all say, look what these people did. Meanwhile, you know, it's it's internal. They, I mean, it's just an incredible thing. This nothing is what it seems to be. That's yeah. what I tell people. Just, you know, once you understand and you wake up finally, you go, wow, everything is just not real. It's not what it appears to be. I yeah, face value. You, you got to dig and you got to look underneath it all. Yeah, I'm sorry I mean to interrupt. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely right. I mean, I've learned, like you did, Greg, a while ago, that everything we've been taught basically is a lie. Like whatever they tell you, just do the opposite. Is the <laughs> simplest way to go, right? Yeah. Um, but I mean, did you ever believe, I'm, this isn't so much a question, it's just more of like a thought, but did you ever believe that we would be living in a uh, uh, world that our, our quote unquote adversaries are our friends and the people we were told our friends are adversaries? It's the complete inverse to what you were, like you were saying. So. You know, look, uh, life is an interesting, interesting uh, journey here, mm-hmm. and, and, and we live and we learn. And, and uh, I, you know, look, I I would have never expected that we'd be where we are right now. This they've been incredibly crafty and and amazingly successful in 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 zombifying the public, making people believe things that are absolutely false. Um, you know, maybe kind of like the boiling frog syndrome, how this is a kind of a slow process here. And, and then again, pointing their fingers in directions where it has nothing to do with it. Again, it's, it's, it's amazing to me how we have, um, every manner of, and every person trying to deflect from who is the real enemy here. And it is the central banks. They're the ones that run the economy. They run the financial system. They run the financial markets. They are the ones who are responsible for the current situation we are in. But again, it's always, it's, it's the, the set of, these central banks have to remain blameless. The Federal Reserve, for example, I mean, you watch, it makes me sick when I see this. When the Federal Reserve chairperson thing, creature Powell, you know, you know what I call him. I hate him. He's a puke. When he walks into a room, a congressional committee, they they genuflect in front of him as if he's like some kind of a, a thank you for your service, sir. Are you kidding me? This guy's responsible for where we are right now. And they got their thank because look, they get it. They all know what's going on too. 
but they can't point their finger at this institution. This institution must remain blameless. And you don't hear really any criticism of, of the Fed other than, oh, well, maybe it was a policy mistake. No, this is, is my mistake. I mean, there are th everything they have thought of and we're seeing now has been planned out decades ago. There's a very slow, methodical pathway. These are the most diabolic institutions in, in the history of the world. And, um, and they have one goal. The goal is power. And there are two goals, power and control. Uh, maybe they're one and the same too. I don't know. But they're, they're, really, um, they're, they're, they're really showing us all who understand what's going on, what they're capable of doing. And I'll tell you something else. We haven't seen anything yet. Again, going towards war, more war, more pain, more death, more suffering, and then more distractions and deceptions at the same time. It's an incredible thing. We can't be free unless we do something about these institutions. So they have to go. If we are forced to live under in their system, under their rulership, and they make all the rules, we're done. We're absolutely done. Absolutely right. 100%. Um, this might be some practical advice for both of our respective audiences, but I'm sure you deal with it. I deal with it where we have friends and family, business colleagues, where they're not afforded to be woken up yet the way that we have been and just don't know what we know. And they believe that the dollar is the almighty everything and it will never change. What practical advice can you give people to help in a succinct way explain to those people that the dollar is not the end all be all they have been taught that it is all these years? I think that that there's so many parts to that question here. First of all, you have to you, ha you have to look at the generation or the or the age group of people that you're talking to. And, and then, you know, People get stuck in their ways and you can't convince them. I'm sure you, you've seen this as well. Mm. I, you know, just very, very recently, you know, I have a, a family member who got caught up in this whole regional bank issue, despite me warning about it before anybody else. I, I, this is way before we saw the, the issues develop. I said, there's a real, real problem here. Oh, no, Greg, it's not going to happen. This is, you know, everything's going to be fine. And you see, people, the problem is when you try to tell somebody the truth, they hate your guts for it. They don't get it. They, they, they block it. They don't want to hear it. There's some kind of a mental issue that goes on. That you have to have a, recept a receptive person, someone that's able to think outside the box. There is no way to convince someone that re that is refusing to accept to the truth to accept it. It just can't happen. Uh, and it's very frustrating, but that's okay too. I think there's a kind of a natural selection going on. I've been telling people this for years. Some of us, uh, and I, I think you know, people who watch our shows, are, are among those people that, that can get it, that are able mm -hmm. to say, hold on a minute, something is wrong. I know it is. Maybe I couldn't really figure it out, but hold on a minute. Now I'm listening to this. I get it. These are the missing pieces. You know, It's a crazy game that we play. It's a game of incomplete information. We're trying to fill in some gaps. And there's no, you know, look, the information is always changing. Um, so we, we got, but we know the macro picture that I think that we've got is is a hundred percent spot on. Um, it's just the little nuances of it all that we have to kind of work on a little bit, but that doesn't even, if you know what the big picture is and you know what our enemy wants and the enemy is the central bank, it's pretty easy to figure out what we need to do about it. Mm -hmm. And that is again, because betting against the debt, becoming your own central bank, uh, forgetting that, you know, realizing that central, that these central banks are devaluing their currency by design on purpose. They're sucking the purchasing power out of it. Um, none of this, 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 this inflationary nightmare that we're in right now, and, and it's going to get a lot worse, is by, is, is by accident here. And these same institutions are not going to fix the problem, as we spoke about already. It's unbelievable. But uh, you know, it should be pretty obvious to people that they need to um, take action, not just sit back and be entertained by listening to stuff like this, but think about what it means for them. And as we said, everybody is a different kind of a situation. Some people, you know, um, you know, have some people are just scrounging by renters to make ends meet. But if they could have any spare cash, I'm going to tell them they should invest in some silver. It's cheap. It's easy. And if you have more, more means, then of course you can get more diversified into other, into other things. We got to be kind of spread out. I think environments like this, as bad as they seem, this is where the op where opportunity lies too. You have to look at the other side of it. Okay. This is really, really bad, but what does it mean? What can I do for myself, my family, for people I care about, all my audience to help them understand what action they should be taking to get themselves in the right spot now? Not We can't be, we can't just react. We have to be preemptive. Mm -hmm. um, we have to take action now against what we know is unfolding, period, the end. I mean, it's so obvious to people like you and me, and I'm sure that people that follow our work, 
but most people, most people, and I mean most people, are going to be absolutely blindsided as this thing is. They don't know what's happening to them now, and yeah. they can't put they they can't figure it out. But it just seems so simple. Yeah, it's it's so simple and yet so difficult at the same time. It's very paradoxical, you know. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate your your practical advice on like engaging your audience and you know who's open and who's not. And that's a very important point. Um, obviously, we agree on many things, and one of which is investing in precious metals. You you talked about that many times, including this. But one other thing I want to ask you, Greg, in branching out, because <clears throat> you know obviously you know platinum, palladium, copper, gold, silver. But what about countries like, let's say, Zimbabwe or Iraq, who are replete with rhodium or phosphorus? Do you recommend those as part of diversification as well? Yes, I I happen to like all commodities. As a matter of fact, I am I'm a massive bull when it comes to commodities, pretty much across the board. And I think that this is I've been telling people I don't know how long to to uh, gain exposure to these things. And people can say, well, how can I do that? I mean, in some cases you can hold the the physical asset. In some cases you you can't. Um, and there there you know they, there are exchange traded funds or ETFs that give people exposure to these things. And then some people say, well, I want to put my money in, a, in an, uh, an exchange or something like that. And uh, so, I mean, that that opens up a whole other thing. But but I, I think, you know, uh, people need exposure to commodities in a massive way here. They need to, it, it, however, whatever works for them, if they want to hold it in their hands, the cheapest way is going to be, in my view, and the best asset of them all is going to be this one right here. Mm -hmm. Gold is my second favorite of all time. I have my two favorites right here. <laughs> Platinum palladium, I love them as well. Um, but yeah, absolutely. These are the things too. The, why I tell people, in fact, I put out, I have a free newsletter, which you probably know. And, um, I have put out at least five, um, lists of, of exchange traded funds that will give people exposure to a wide variety of, of commodities. I, I think that's important. I think people need that in their portfolio in one way or the other, whether you're going to hold it or you want exposure another way. Again, it, it comes down to the individual person as to how they feel they want to expose themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I only have a couple more questions because I know you're, you're pressed for time and we really do appreciate, um, I think all of us appreciate your input on all these uh, matters. Um, so we see the dollar index as of this morning, it was approaching close to 105. Some people feel that that could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on which way you are on the fence. How do you see that in relation to the overall market and it has it relates to cryptos? I think, and I've been telling people this for an hour freaking long, we're going to see the dollar, at least on a relative strength basis, remain the prettiest bell at the ball. Um, it's just that's kind of until until it's not. And, and, and I think until it's not, it's going to be too late. So people, again, need to be taking the opposite side of that. And that is getting into cryptocurrencies and into metals as well here. Uh, this is going to continue for a while. And if you notice, it's kind of interesting. You know, we, we, you see that knee jerk into the dollar and all of a sudden in the market gets, you get these little signs, you know, um, and then the market doesn't really like it. Although we have the 10 year yield, which is stable or has been relatively stable. I look at those things, two things. First, if you know, my MMRI, the Manorino market risk indicator, which is free for everyone. It kind of, it uses the dollar. It uses the 10 year yield and puts it together in a neat little equation. It comes up with a color code and it comes up with a number. It's right available on my website, second page. Right, right at the top. Uh, so, you know, this is not a risk. This is not a crash indicator. It's a risk indicator in real time. And and with risk in the market, you know, you got to look at these things and say, well, even though let's say we have a, right now, according to the MMRI, the we have a high risk environment. What does that mean? Does it mean that the market should be under pressure? Not necessarily. The market seems to be fine here, especially because it all, well, half the market believes the Fed's going to cut rates, probably the other half doesn't. And that's why we were seeing the the 10 year yield kind of, we were at 4.3 and change just maybe two weeks ago. Then we dropped down into, into the 4.1879, something like that. And now we're kind of settling back up just a little bit. You know, there's still that little bit of uncertainty, but it's a, it's a lock to me that this is what's going to happen. We're going to get cuts, ECB. Fed's going to do this in lockstep. We're going to see a lot more easy money pumped into the market, unfortunately. Um, that's going to has the potential to push the stock market much higher as it devalues the currency as well. Again, this is a mechanism here that's going on. And it's there's a ripple effect that happens when central banks do what they're about to do. 
and, and that also presents opportunity in commodities, for example, here, if we understand that central banks are going to cut rates by creating vast amounts of cash out of thin air, getting into the market and buying it, so what does that mean? It means the currencies are going to suffer. So that means you should gain your exposure to commodities. You see how, see, there's the ripple effect we're talking mm -hmm. about. It's just, so, this isn't rocket science that we do. It's really not. But it, it's basically common sense understanding how money or cash flows through the markets because it does so in predictable patterns if we have the right information. And I think, we, I think we're on top of it, honestly. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Okay, so last question for today's interview until next time. Um, you see the Japan's market is tanking, right? You see the bond market. They're dumping our treasuries like you've talked about with the 10-year yield. They're having a lot of problems, not unlike a lot of countries, but for a long time, they were considered the stalwart country. Um, do you see them jumping into BRICS as a safe haven? And if they do, do you think that's enough to help them? If that happened, I, I think that would be uh, that would be a sign that things are about to get extremely bad. Uh, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Um, but, you know, we've seen other things, I guess, like the Swiss National Bank pull off this. I don't think so. Uh, it, it would be quite um, a shocking moment, uh, honestly. Um, you know, who knows it's going to come down the pike here, but I don't think anytime soon. I, I don't think people even need to think about it. Okay, fair right enough. Right now. But right we'll, now. you know what? We'll address this next time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's moving from moment to moment. It changes so quickly. But no, that, that's fair. Thank you for that. Um, Greg, as always, we, we leave our shows um, asking our special guests like you, where can people find out about your work? And final thoughts you have for the audience today. You can find me pretty much anywhere. I'm easy to find. But go to my website, tradestrace.net, easy YouTube. I do two videos per day. Look, people, um, I'm going to leave you off with this. Just be ready. Be ready for anything. Always have the high ground. Um, don't sit back and, you know, get yourself drunk on watching uh, the nonsense for that they're going to fist feed you. You know, pay attention to shows like this, and you're going to find out what's really going on. Otherwise, you're going to be lost. Because that's what they want you like. They want you lost. They want you confused. They want you in some kind of uh, uh, crazy induced psyop. That's mm -hmm. what they're doing. This is a psyop, I think, on a grand scale. You people who pay attention to the mainstream media, they have no idea. They have no idea, and nor will they, about what's actually going on. So we just ignore all that stuff. Yeah, exactly. Or they think, well, if I watch Fox or I watch this, I'll get a better or different perspective, not realizing <laughs> it's, it's all feathers of the same bird. So Yes, it is. Absolutely. Well, Greg Manorino, always a privilege to have you. Thank you for joining us on the podcast, and we look forward to having you again soon. Excellent. Thank you, too.